Hello and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. As you might have guessed, this show is about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack, and with me today is Cameron Guerra. Welcome, Cam. Hey, how's it going, man? It's going good. It's been a while. It has. Yeah, I was looking and it's been about a year since we've done a podcast, so I'm really glad to be back with you and uh, just give all of our viewers some new content to listen to. Mm-hmm. So just a little little off of our weekly schedule, but we're getting there. <laughs> um, and we're coming back at an exciting time because it's October, which means it's Hacktoberfest. Um, and I, I understood that you found an interesting repo uh, for Haskell Hacktoberfest shenanigans. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Hacktoberfest is an opportunity for us to all contribute to the open source world um, and to contribute to public repos and create PRs against um, these public repos. So uh, you put four um, PRs together and get those um, submitted and you're going to get a t-shirt. And so with this new project that I'm uh, going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be able to do that and learn Haskell at the same time. So Funny enough, the name is Learn for Haskell. Um, so with a it's four an opportunity in the middle, right? kind of, What's that? With a number four in the middle. Learn for exactly. Haskell. For Haskell, yeah. And you know, we're going to provide the link for you. There's going to be two places uh, in the show notes. You can check that out. And also on uh, this week's edition of Haskell Weekly, which, Taylor, could you remind me what version we're on? <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. We're on version 232, I think. Wow. So 232 weeks you've been doing this? Yeah, that's a lot of weeks. Almost four years. Four, five years? I can't do math. <laughs> well, hey, we're, we're, we're super thankful you've taken on that project. And, uh, you know, now we're spinning it out a little bit more, doing some more podcasting. Yeah, man. So yeah, look for that link to learn for Haskell in the show notes. And if you're interested in Hacktoberfest, but maybe not interested in Haskell, then I wonder what are you doing listening to this podcast? But you can go to hacktoberfest.com and read more about it there. Yep. Awesome, man. Well, uh, I mean, without further ado, I think we should uh, kind of dive into our subject for the day, huh? I agree. And today we're going to be looking at a blog post called Strategic Deriving. Uh, it comes to us via Kowainik, and it's authored by Veronika Romashkina and Dmitry Kovanikov. And uh, I'm sure I butchered their names, so I apologize in advance for that. But um, yeah, this is a post talking about how deriving works in Haskell and why you might want to use it. Yeah. I think that's uh, awesome, and, and you know, I want to give a shout out to you know, these two authors. They did a very thorough job uh, on this post, and so you know, I'm glad we can kind of, you know, just use it as a jumping off point because you know, there's a lot of content in it. So you know, feel free to find the article and, and check it out yourself. Um, but for us, yeah, we're we're super excited to talk about it. So, uh, Taylor, what's what's the big idea? <laughs> the big idea is that. We can avoid writing a bunch of boilerplate and we can have the compiler do the work for us and prove that it's correct. Um, and this is super convenient because it'll save us a bunch of typing and it'll make us feel more confident in the code that we produce. Yeah, but yeah, I as think. you mentioned, this blog post is, it's a giant resource and it's great, but there's so much here that we're just going to start scratching the surface on it. And if you're listening to this and you think it sounds interesting, I encourage you to go read it. Uh, we'll put the link in the show notes. It is very thorough, very good resource. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about deriving, you know, we have these type classes in Haskell that offer us, you know, some out of the box functions and functionality for different types. Um, you know, what are some of the pros and cons of deriving? I know you kind of mentioned a little bit, uh, but can you go in a little more de detail? For sure. To me, the main pro to deriving, and when we talk about pros and cons here, we're going to be contrasting it with writing these instances by hand. And for me, the biggest pro with deriving is that it reduces the amount of code that you have to write. It reduces boilerplate. So I think the typical example is like a show instance where maybe you defined a record 
and it has a bunch of fields on it. And if you wanted to write a show instance by hand, you would have to write out all of those field names and then write show that field name of that record. And if your record has, you know, 20 fields on it, all of a sudden that becomes 20 more lines of code that you have to maintain and keep in sync with that data type. Uh, it's just, it's no fun. It's no fun to write that. Yeah. And, and, and I know from personal experience, we, we've had some of those issues uh, where, you know, we've added a new peel to a record and we didn't update a JSON instance or, and, and you know, we went through PR and it ended up into production and people were like, Hey, like, where's this field? You know, cause they were relying on that being there. Um, and then it would, you know, create issues for us that we'd have to, you know, jump to you know, resolve. Right. Yeah. It, it makes, it makes our job harder because we can't rely on the compiler to tell us that our instance matches our type declaration or our, you know, the record we're defining. And like you're saying, leaving out fields is a super common one. And if you have a bunch of instances, you mentioned JSON. So like if you define a data type, you have to define how that thing can be parsed from JSON, how it can be converted to JSON. And if you have other formats that you convert in and out of, those are listed as well. So like BSON or YAML or to the database or, you know, proto buffs, whatever you're using. If you have all of those, suddenly you have all this code to maintain. So you go update one little field and GHC says, yeah, I'm happy, but you forgot to update it in 10 other places. Yeah, that that's definitely one big downside to, uh, you know, deriving your own instances and, and not using deriving. Um, yeah, downside to writing them by hand. Upside to uh, deriving. Sorry, yeah, upside to deriving. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I flipped <laughs> the pro-con list there. I apologize. But no yeah, problem. so the, um, yeah, and another one that, you know, I've run into... Um, a few times and kind of been baffled when, you know, my code crashes and my everything kind of freezes on it is because I've created an, you know, infinitely recursive instance uh, that's <laughs> not properly translated. And the compiler says, yeah, you're good. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't detect or see that, um, you know, infinite recursive mm -hmm. bit of code. Yeah. And to give a, a kind of more concrete example of this, um, if you're defining like a JSON instance for something that's a new type wrapper, what you probably want to do is remove the new type. So like unwrap it and then call to JSON on the thing on the inside. Um, but what you might accidentally do is forget to unwrap it and just call to JSON directly. And that's actually going to type check because you are defining an instance for how to convert this thing to JSON. But then in your instance, you're using, you're calling itself over and over again. And, and GHC won't catch this error and you'll be mystified in production. Like we're seeing hundred percent CPU usage. Why is that? Everything <laughs> passed the test, everything passed code review. Well, hopefully you, it doesn't pass the tests, but the compiler was happy. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, great thing for tests. We can always be about plugging tests here mm -hmm. at Ask Weekly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know, another, Nice one. Then I kind of think you've touched on it, but like, you know, you've got consistency, you know, between you know, different modules, different types, there's, you know, a consistent code feel, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you look at a type and you, 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 you've seen all the record accessors and then you say, oh yeah, let me see what instances it has. And it's right there. Uh, easy to see, easy to understand. Uh, so I really think that's a nice pro for uh, this deriving tool. I agree. I think there are two parts to this even where on the one hand you have um, across your code base, as people get acclimated to it, you can look at a data type and just know what all of the instances are going to look like. So for instance, again, with JSON using it as an example, maybe for every field, you make all the characters lowercase and put hyphens between the words for the field names. And you can just look at the record declaration and see, oh, this field is called whatever it is. And I know that when it gets converted to JSON, it's gonna look like this instead. You don't have to actually read through the instance to see how it's doing any of those conversions. And then the other side of this is that by using deriving, like visually the amount of code that you have to parse in order to understand which instances are provided is very little. You can see, 
deriving to JSON from JSON, show, eek, generic, ord, rather than having, you know, 50 lines of code with five different instances there, uh, you can just read it all on one line. Yeah, I think that's a, a super big benefit and you know, really helps you know, just keep that you know, co code more maintainable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's that's the big thing. Yeah, so, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of pros. Um, you know, there is a lot of good reasons but to, to use deriving, but there's also, you know, some, some, some drawbacks um, or cons, as you will. Um, you know, so, so what are some of those? Yeah, it's not all roses with deriving, unfortunately. Um, one of the, the ones that we run into frequently, and, and I should probably specify that uh, for you and me, Cam, we're working on a Haskell application at IT Pro TV day in, day out. So most of our experience is colored by that. We don't maintain many open source libraries. Um, we mostly focus on this one application. So some of these things are more applicable to apps versus libs, but just, just so everyone knows where our biases are. Um, but yeah, one of the downsides uh, for us with deriving is that as soon as you wanna do something a little bit different, then you have to kind of scrap all of the deriving stuff and go back to doing it completely manually. And again, to keep using JSON as a example here, imagine that for any API that we get to define, we use our lowercase letters with hyphens between the words scheme, but we have to integrate with a third party and they wrote their thing in C sharp and it wants camel cased words. So when we want to talk to them, we can't use that derived type anymore. We have to write it ourselves manually. Right. So that leads to, you know, that special case, right? That, that's mm -hmm. that one special case that kind of pokes a hole in, in easy deriving. Yeah. Which is definitely, definitely a, a bummer. Um, yeah. And, and I think another thing too, with this, um, deriving is that, you know, it can be a little unclear what an instance does because the, the code's not right there, right? You, you need to go to, you know, stackage or hackage or, or Google and find, you know, what the definition of this type class and these functions are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is where, you know, in a language like go something that proponents of that language go to a lot is that you can look at the code and see pretty clearly what it's doing. There's not a whole lot there to surprise you, but with deriving, the whole point is that there's nothing there. It's all abstracted away. So if you don't already know what it does, there's not really anything to guide you into guessing what it does. Right. So, but I mean, in my opinion, I, I don't find it that bad to, you know, oh, I'm not sure what this, you know, very specific type class is doing. Let me go check out the functions and see what their type definitions are. Uh, yeah. You know, I think the documentation in, ha in Haskell is good enough to check that out and figure it out. You know, um, I agree. So yeah. And typically there aren't that many type classes that you're working with. So as you get, you know, introduced to a code base, you're probably going to become familiar with those type classes and then you'll get a feeling for how they're implemented by default. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what is the performance impact, um, of using this abstraction level or ab abstraction level, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, this is actually something I've spent a lot of time looking at. Um, and I can leave a couple links in the show notes to blog posts I've written that look at the performance of, um, various methods of dealing with this boilerplate. But, um, the, the short version is that deriving, uh, specifically through generics, which is what this blog post spends a lot of time talking about is one of the slowest methods to compile, which is unfortunate because it has a lot of other really nice benefits. And when I say one of the slowest, what I mean is in comparison to writing the instance by hand or deriving it via template Haskell, which is essentially code generation at compile time, um, using a generic deriving is going to be slower than either of those methods, but clearly there are other upsides. And so it's up to the people writing the code to decide, is it worth, you know, taking an extra second per instance declaration? It, this is just a fake number. I don't know how long extra it would be. You would have to run your own benchmarks, right. but is it worth taking a little extra time in order to 
you know, get these other pros that we talked about at the top of the show. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, you know, a good thing to consider in when you're working within a team and, you know, you're kind of focused on, oh, hey, like, you know, we want to be as performant as possible. You know, we want to keep our compile times down. Like, oh, this is a side effect of, you know, deriving, um, you know, and, and generic deriving, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that's something to consider. For us, we're like, yeah, let's do it, you know, less <laughs> boilerplate, less, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, as someone who's come from using both, you know, instance deriving and, you know, this you know, deriving feature that, you know, you can do, you know, we've experienced a lot of the tensions of the instance deriving, mm-hmm. um, whereas, you know, and we've, we've really been making a concerted effort to moving towards, you know, just regular little driving. Yeah. And there are definitely ways to lessen the impact of the performance penalty you take with generic deriving. Um, Matt Parsons has a good blog post talking about how to keep your builds fast. And for the most part, it comes down to keeping modules small and putting types in their own modules. Um, and we've been trying to do that as we move to more generic driving in our code base. Right, right. Uh, you know, so we've got one more con here. Um, you know, what what's so difficult, you know, about deriving, a, you know, a type class that allows deriving mm-hmm. or writing a type class that allows deriving? Yeah, so we, using JSON as our go-to example, um, when you're using a library like ASON, it provides this whole mechanism for you. So you have your choice is to opt into using deriving. But um, providing that option to other people can be a challenge because you have to rely on the generic machinery that GHC provides you. And that can be a little different or a lot different than your day-to-day programming. Um, And I feel like it's important to contrast this with the alternatives. So with template Haskell, you could write essentially something that parses a Haskell data declaration and produces some instance declaration from that, which is not actually, but you could think of it as being a textual like search and replace. If you see this, do this. Mm-hmm. Um, or in your documentation, you could provide, you know, this is what an instance normally looks like, copy paste it and change some stuff around. Um, to do the generic deriving, you have to understand how generics are represented in you know, the Haskell level values, how to connect all these type classes together. And these things aren't insurmountable problems, but they are a barrier to clear. And I think kind of the silver lining here is that it's pretty uncommon to define new type classes that need generic deriving. Um, And if you do need to do that, there are good resources for doing it. Either you can go crib from another library that does it already, or um, there are some recent talks about you know, how does the generic um, type representation, what does it look like and how do you work with it? Right. Yeah. And and I think, you know, reading and and understanding what was happening in this blog post, you know, you hit, you know, this section about the generics and what it looks like under the covers. And you're like, ah, like you just (laughs) want to, you know, put those down and, you know, not look anymore because it's just, you know, there's a lot going on there. And I think, you know, it kind of, proves how powerful you know haskell can be but it obviously takes you know a little bit of you know thought and brain power to kind of parse those you know what that's actually doing Mm -hmm. well yeah so we've got uh you know different types of deriving correct is that is that a thing i think they're called strategies right yeah i i don't remember which version of ghc introduced them but there's this new concept of deriving strategies or it's not actually a new concept but it used to be implicit and now it's explicit and the strategies there are four of them one of them is stock and what stock means is this is a type class that the haskell report like the spec for the language Mm -hmm. has defined how it should behave so it's only a handful of them and they're the stuff that you're familiar with, like show and eek and read and that kind of stuff. And ix. Everybody knows ix. Ix. Can't forget ix. 
Um, and then there's also new type, which um, you may be familiar with through the generalized new type deriving language extension. And new type deriving lets you kind of delegate your instance to the type that you're wrapping around. So for instance, if you have like a user ID type that is a wrapper around an int, new type deriving would effectively just say, use the int instance for whatever type class I'm deriving here. Mm -hmm. And then the last two strategies are any class and via. And any class is the one that powers this generic deriving stuff where there is typically gonna be a default implementation of the type class methods. And those default implementations are gonna be powered by a generic representation of the type. And then via kind of piggybacks on the other three, but what it does is it lets you define your type class instance through another type. So you kind of like conceptually wrap up the type you're dealing with in this other type that you're deriving via, and then the instance will be generated based on that one. Um, I feel like I'm doing a poor job explaining exactly what it is, but it's a very powerful tool, um, very neat. You should check it out. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've started to use this a little bit in our day-to-day, -day, and it's really saved us a lot of time and effort from um, having to write um, instances with, you know, with Swagger. So we, you know, use Servant and Swagger more recently, um, and that's something that, you know, we, you know, Taylor did a lot of effort on creating this type that would allow us to not have to do so much boilerplate. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're very thankful for that, um, and it kind of, Got us, gave us the opportunity to kind of learn more about VIA. Yeah, and this is a, a good way to come back to the pros we were talking about earlier because we've been using JSON as an example over and over again. And once you bring Swagger into the picture, which is like automated API documentation, you're going to want the shape of your JSON data as part of that API documentation. And by using derived instances for this stuff, you can make sure that your JSON instance and the documentation for that JSON instance actually match each other rather than writing them by hand and potentially having a mismatch there. Right, yeah. It saves us a ton of time and, and, it's, and it's great. Uh, question, mm -hmm. why don't we really see when we're deriving like this need to define exactly what strategy we're using? So normally GHC will pick a strategy for you. And like I said earlier, um, in the past, it has always been implicit. And then in some relatively recent version of GHC, they give you the ability to explicitly specify the strategy. So for instance, when you do deriving show, that's always going to be stock. Um, but if you turn on this deriving strategies extension, you could instead say deriving new type show. And the difference there would be that the you know, stringified representation of that type would no longer include the new type wrapper's name like it normally does. That would be stripped out because you're gonna be using the inner types instance directly. Um, but to answer your question, uh, normally it is implicit and then you can make it explicit. And for us, the normal way that we make it explicit is by using deriving via, which is one of the strategies. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, I found that bit cool when they talked about how you can explicitly say, yes, we're going to use new type deriving here. And it's, you know, for the show instance, you know, it's going to take away that type wrapper within the stringified version. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty neat because, you know, obviously, you know, show is, is a great resource and, uh, you know, or a great uh, type class that allows you really to debug and understand what's happening in your code. But sometimes the output can be a little bit um, daunting because it's so, you know, if you have large records or a list of records, it's kind of hard to parse what's going on. Um, yeah. And so, you know, being able to like maybe remove some of that, you know, complexity it could be nice. Yeah. A good example from our code base is that we use UUIDs for some of our unique identifiers, but we have an internal type that we wrap around UUIDs that we call a GUID. And then we wrap domain specific types around that one. So we have like a user ID is a wrapper around a GUID, which is a wrapper around a UUID. So 
by default, when you show that, you'll get the literal text user ID parenthesis GUID parenthesis UUID parenthesis and then the and then the thing you're actually interested in. Right. And by using new type deriving at each step of the way, you could strip out those things and just get the ID. Yeah. I mean I would be curious to see how you know our team felt about doing something like that. Um, you know, obviously we don't have to use show too too much, but when we do you know, that would be a really nice thing for the instances where we have yeah. a very nested type. Yeah, because you can lose kind of the overall shape of the data you're looking at when there are too many details included like that. Yeah, well, awesome. Thank you for, you know, kind of talking about the strategies a little bit. You know, for me, it's, this was all been a learning experience kind of, you know, obviously I've used deriving and I've, you know, derived specific instances, but you know, kind of the mechanics behind it were, were really kind of cool and neat to learn about. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, so we've got a couple more minutes here, and I just want to kind of touch real quick um, on some of the best practices they mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll wrap it up, but, uh, you know, trying to be cognizant of our viewers' time, and, you know, we, we want <laughs> Listeners. to be glad you're on board. Maybe their viewers, don't too. don't want to bore you to death. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so some of the best practices. So the one that they touch on first, um, I think you could talk about a little about always deriving the show and eek type classes. Why why do you want to do that? Yeah, I mean, it helps, you know, working in, in the REPL. You know, if you're trying to, you know, see what an output's going to be, you're going to need a show instance so it, it can display, um, you know, and also testing. You know, you're generally going to have to, you know, kind of see what's happening, see what the mechanics of your code are doing, and then see what the types are along the way. Um, so I think that's, you know, some of the real pros to that. But one of the cons being, you know, you have to be cognizant of maybe a type that you don't want publicly shared, like a password or, you know, a token, you know. And mm -hmm. if you do want to still have show instances of those, you just be cognizant to make a, a custom instance for that that, you know, redacts the sensitive information. Yeah, and this can be a somewhat tricky decision of do I want to provide a show instance that hides the information or do I want to not provide a show instance at all? And for us, the way that we typically lean is like using password as an example. Let's go ahead and provide an instance for it, but the only thing that it outputs is going to be like the word redacted. Um, and that way, if we have a record that includes a password within it, we can still show that record and see kind of the overall shape of it, but we're not going to leak any of that sensitive data. Um, if you go the other way and don't include the instance at all, then if your user type has a password on it, you can no longer show a user, which to us is super frustrating. Yeah. And I mean, and if you're dealing with maybe some smaller types, um, you know, you can always kind of create an, your own, function that turns that type into a string that can easily be shown or, mm -hmm. you know, a turn it into another type that has a show instance. But, you know, I think, you know, what you said about kind of creating it your own so you can then you know, use it in a larger record and, and have a show instance for the larger record. Yeah. Um, I think it makes a big deal. Um, yeah. So, I mean, at that point, you know, they kind of talked about, um, you know, deriving generics. Uh, do you have anything kind of to add on that as a best practice? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we are mostly focused on application development. So for us, the choice of do we add a generic instance or not really comes down to are we using that generic instance? But for library authors, the question is different because whether or not you use it in your code base um, or in your library, I should say, if any of your users are going to need that instance, then you have to provide it. So more often than not, if you're defining custom data types in your library that other people are supposed to use, you probably should have generic instances on them. And I just want to touch on earlier, I also mentioned how generic deriving can be slower than other, um, other ways to provide instances. And that's true, but providing a generic instance by itself is very quick. It's when you start to use it that things slow down a little bit. Mm. So if you're afraid of providing generic instances for performance reasons, I would, I would say don't be afraid of that. Go ahead and provide it. 
persevere and go through strong. <laughs> you got yes, this. For sure. Well, awesome. Well, hey, I, I really appreciate you kind of, you know, talking through this post a little bit from a, you know, a high level. Obviously, if you want more detail, you know, go read the post, kind of dive in because, you know, you're going to really be able to, you know, kind of walk away with, you know, kind of a new understanding of what's happening behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, at least at least I did. Um, yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, I think that's about it. Cam, thank you for bringing this post, you know, to my attention and really taking the time to dig into it. Um, it's always nice to get a deeper understanding of something that we use day in and out, but haven't really had the reason to go look into the intricacies. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've, I'm obviously, you know, honestly just can, trying to continue to learn, uh, you know, as an engineer, like that's, that's our job. Um, obviously, yes, your job is to code, but you know, if you don't learn and adapt and kind of figure out something new every day, you're going to, you know, you're going to get past real quick. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm you know, definitely lo- always looking for stuff, um, you know, and, and, and I would like to actually invite maybe some of our viewers if they have a pod, you know, or no, a podcast that they want for like a blog post that they, you know, really enjoy, you know, feel free to, to send it to us, um, you know, and we would love to, you know, talk about it, look, look at it, review it, um, you know, and spread the word per se. Um, yeah. You know, it, what, what would be a good way for them to send that if they were interested? So for our listeners, if they have something that they want us to do a deep dive on, do a podcast episode on, uh, you can reach out to Haskell Weekly via email, which is going to be info at news, Or you can hit us up on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is Haskell Weekly. Shouldn't be any surprises there. Um, or if you find me or Cameron on, you know, Reddit, Twitter, wherever, um, we can take suggestions there as well. Yep. Yeah. So I think that will do it for us today. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, this has been a little longer than our normal podcasts, but this has been, you know, a really solid resource that we've been able to chew through and we wanted to do it justice. So Thank you, Cam, for uh, hanging out with me. I appreciate it. Always, man. Always. And thank you again for listening. If you would like to find out more about Haskell Weekly, please go to our website, haskellweekly.news. And once you're there, you can subscribe to the newsletter, which goes out every week. Or you can subscribe to this podcast, which comes out either every week or about once a year, depending. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, and, and also feel free to follow us on Twitter, you know, mm-hmm. it's Twitter, a great place to Reddit, find us everywhere. We are everywhere. All right. Thanks so much, y'all. Happy hacking. Happy hacking.